Take note of Divinity Rocks. For she is the subject of this edition of the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. On this podcast, we follow the musical journey of our guests from the very first time they make contact with their instrument of choice to the present. Divinity Rocks is an unusual case, as she hadn't played bass for very long when she went to bass camp run by Victor Wooten, who is pretty much a bass player's bassist if ever there was one. And he then invited her to come on tour with him. And then the big time called. She went on to join Beyonce's all-female band from 2006 through 2011. But something didn't feel right. A solo career was calling. Educational pursuits were calling. We'll get to all of that. She stopped by the Berkeley Online office in Boston on a recent windy day, which I mentioned because you might sometimes hear the wind in the background of this recording. And she was in town to perform a 10th anniversary show with the Beyonce band and to check in with us at Berkeley Online because she begins studying with us next semester. But her first instrument was not bass. It was clarinet. Let us begin when Divinity Rocks was a very small child. As a very small child, I remember just riding in the back of the car listening to songs and how they moved me. Like they would touch my heart and I would sit in the back and just sing my heart out, singing these grown people songs and I could just feel this emotion. And I didn't even understand most of the time what I was singing about, Yeah. but it just touched me. So when the band director came around to all the classes and asked, who wants to play in the band? My hand shot up in the air like, yes, I want to play in the band. Um, who wants to play? Then the chorus teacher would come around. Who wants to play in the chorus? Who wants to sing in the chorus? My hand shot up. I used to love music class. Once a week, Miss Rosalind Lewis was my music teacher. She's amazing. I just loved it. Just loved singing and playing. But as far as knowing that I could be a part of it all, I guess in high school, well, in middle school, I started rapping. Rap changed my life. So that's like mid 80s, late 80s. Yeah, yeah. late 80s. So it's an in- interesting <clears throat> point there where it's like still some of the old school. Oh, and, yeah. And, and like the newer wave was like starting, like PE was. Absolutely. Yeah. MC Light, yeah. um, Slick Rick, Slick Rick the Ruler. Um, who else did I used to listen to? Queen Latifah, Moni Love, you know, all the old school hip hop. You know, I mean, I used to record all the shows when I would sleep. I would turn on my little tape deck, turn the volume down, and hit record. So to basically, record your the radio life shows. was juicy. That yes, my the life was version. juicy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but now, so you you said you know your hand went up when uh, asking who wants to play instruments. What were you playing then? What did you? I played the clarinet. The clarinet. That okay. was my first instrument. Okay. I loved it though. Yeah. I did. When's the last time you picked it up? <sighs> we were in. Gosh, what country were we in? We were somewhere, and somehow, we were in the lobby of some hotel, and, and, and we being the, the band, Beyonce, Beyonce band. band. Okay. <laughs> On, I don't remember even what tour it was. Some of the girls always know all the details. I never remember okay. the details. We were in the lobby of some hotel. Tia was playing the clarinet, I think. And I was like, give me that clarinet. Yeah. <laughs> I took it and, boy, I couldn't even get a note out of it. Really, really. So, okay, you play clarinet, then you start, you know, rapping for yourself. Are you recording your raps or anything? Oh, or yeah, realizing? man. We recorded. We went in the studio. We made oh, okay. an album. So this was serious stuff. Yeah, we okay. were serious. We started hobby. our own record label. Okay. okay. We pressed up our own tapes. What was the label CDs, called? What Foolproof. Call Foolproof. Yeah. Foolproof Records. Name. Me yeah. and my homies. And uh, we had a group called Dat Boo. Okay. Divinity in the Breakfast Unit. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yes. Is this available anywhere now? You know, some people will uh, every now and again pull out a tape and post it on Instagram. Say, yeah. look at this. It was little green tape. 
Yeah. Um, I still have it. We had some really good songs. We were always positive. Yeah. We wanted to promote positive rap. Um, so it was beautiful. We had a song about AIDS on there. Oh, wow. I forgot about that song. It was some really cool stuff on there. Yeah. And if the people you made that music with were in this room today and you had to rehearse for that <laughs> for a show like you're doing now, would you be able to remember all the words? No, but no. I would be able, we would be able to remember the intro. Yeah. So tonight, on this very night, you're about to hear, we swear, the best star rappers of the year. You know, we would start the show like that. That's Acapella, great. the three of us going in and out of each other. And then my, our DJ, DJ Kimmett, would drop the beat. And then it would just be on. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so it's interesting. This is a great filling in the blank that you've done. Because, you know, in, in your bio, it mentions you go to journalism school, and that's where you discover bass. But... It's interesting to know the uh, chapters before that. Yeah. So, so you're rapping in <coughs> middle school and high school, and then, um, then what's your involvement? Uh, is that the extent of your involvement? I mean, you're, you're putting these things out, so you're obviously serious about it. Oh, yeah, we were very serious about it. Well, when we were in high school, and well, I was in middle school and high school, we weren't putting the albums out. So what happened was I go to college because <clears throat> I was accepted to UC Berkeley. The other Berkeley. The other Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> how ironic is yeah, that? Yeah, that's right? funny. It's so I love how you say like. Uh, at one I point, went to the wrong Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> no, not. I mean, I really wanted to go to this school. It was far mm. away from home, and I didn't know I was a musician yet. You right. know, I mean, I didn't consider being a rapper a musician. Right. So my parents, you know, I had to honor my parents and and go to school. And I loved education. And I loved school. And I needed that experience. But that's where I picked up the bass. So I started playing bass there. Well, <laughs> what was the first bass line you... you, you wow. You were, you were, tell me about like the first time you actually started playing. Like when, when somebody said, here is a bass guitar. Well, you know, a friend of mine, and it's so funny, his name is Paris. That year, he was lugging around this upright bass. And yeah. we were having these jam sessions. And my, I moved off campus, moved into this apartment with all these crazy people. and met this guy Paris and this guy Ajay who played the drums up in the Bay Area and they were doing jam sessions so we were like hey you guys should just come to our house and do them yeah and like okay cool I thought it was gonna be like maybe you know a few MCs them he's playing upright Ajay on the drums we're just freestyling ciphering half of Oakland showed up to my house yeah. me and my roommates were like who are all these people? We don't know who these people are. And you're a freshman in college at this point? I was, I was point? a sophomore okay, at that you're point. A sophomore. Okay. We're like, what happened? <clears throat> but it was awesome. I was the MC and I would pass the mic around. We had this one guy, he had a little turntable, he's scratching, upright bass, drums. It was amazing. So Paris, ironically, only played bass that year of his life. Huh. He was a guitar player. Okay. So we would we hung out a lot. I don't know. We just had that. We just had chemistry. We were hanging out, and I remember I was painting my room, and he came over, in the middle of the floor, and he would just pra be practicing upright, and I'm painting the walls, painting my room red or something yeah. crazy. And I go, you know what? I think I'm gonna get a guitar. And he was like, why? He's like, no, you should get a bass. I was like, why should I get a bass? He was like, cause you like, you come out, you come across as a bass player. And I was like, really? He said, yeah. He's like, and if you get a bass, I'll show you some stuff on bass. Okay. But he was a guitar player. Okay. So I was like, okay. So I went home that summer and I bought a shiny red Washburn. Nice. Because it was shiny and red. Right. <laughs> Sparkly. <laughs> and, uh, and I went back and he showed me these exercises um, and they were tough and they were long and boring, but I would turn on records like Goody Mob was a big deal mm -hmm. from Atlanta. And the Me and You uh, uh, bass line. Um, boom, 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 boom. I could play that and I would just sit at home and turn on records and just try to play along. And I bought a Mel Bay book. Yeah. Because <laughs> I said, I should, I should probably learn how to read bass taught myself to read bass because I, re I remembered how to read treble clef and I would sit there and practice those scales and turn on music and play and I just fell in love mm -hmm. so I called my parents and I think I was running out of money for school and I was like you know I think I'm gonna come home for a year 
my rap group, those guys were sort of struggling and we kept trying to figure out how we were gonna connect. I had moved so far away from home. So I was like, let's come home, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come home, let's make an album. And that's when we started the label. Mm-hmm. And put oh, out okay. the record. Yeah, so we started it when I came home. Okay. Foolproof Records. Um, so yeah, that's serious stuff then. Like, <clears throat> that's, I'm changing my MO and yeah. gonna do this. That's not kids in high school just no, having no, fun. No, 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 we, we no. Were, we were very serious. We used to call the labels and yeah. and pretend like, my, my boy had a real deep voice, so he would pretend like he was our manager right. and start like trying to get in touch with A&R, like, yo, you need to listen to this, this group. So this is probably what, mid-90s? Yeah, um, late 90s? yep, mid-90s, yeah. mid to late 90s. Okay, and then do you go on to J school or is, were you just studying journalism at Berkeley? <clears throat> I was studying journalism at Berkeley. Okay. That was my and major. Then, then comes the Victor Wooten base camp. Crazy. And I don't imagine many students at Victor Wooten base camp get to go on tour with him after. <laughs> I don't think so anybody's I, been able to do that how, since How then. did that happen? Dude, um, so I had this personality in Atlanta where I was a rapper to some people. Yeah. And then I started bringing out the bass every now and again to little jam sessions. You know, there were so many musicians at that time. Taurus Mateen was a really big influence. And it's ironic because Taurus was a bass player and he played on a lot of Outkast and Goody Mob records. Yeah. So I would see him play and he was really good. So I was like, I play bass. It was like my secret thing, you yeah. know, me playing bass. And he was like, really? I was like, yeah. He's like, why don't you come out? Uh, my brothers and I play together. Why don't you come out to one of our sessions and we'll see. Yeah. So I go out to their session and I don't know much about bass. So Taurus would show me a bass line. He was giving me lessons on, you know, in the session. Right. So, so it was like a, a practice bass. It was like not a like a live session. No, not like okay. a live session. When we were outside of this, seriously, we were outside of this uh, fried fish restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> in the West End of Atlanta, and they were playing outside for, I don't know, for themselves and for the customers who would come up. So they right. were just playing right. outside. So he would show me a bass line. So I'd be like, okay. He'd wait till I got it. I would get the bass line, and I would just sit on it. And then he would just solo all over it. That's what he wanted to do. Yeah. He needed somebody like me and his <laughs> band so that he could just take solos all the right. time. So he's like, he's like, okay, you got a groove, you got a pocket. He's like, uh, you should start doing gigs with us. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, we have a gig at the Comedy Corner on Sunday. We're playing for poets. And uh, after we play and the poets do their thing, there's a comedy show. So he's like, come on Sunday and, and we're going to play. I'm like, what are we going to play? He's like, we're just going to do what we just did. Yeah. What? So I'm nervous. I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it. I can't get out of it. I show up with my bass. And this is still the sparkly red washburn? The sparkly red okay. washburn, yep. And, and he, he, the whole show, he would just play a bass line, wait until I got it. I would get it. His brother Omar was playing drums. His brother um, Raji was on saxophone. And we were just improvising behind poets. Yeah. Taurus was so good at that. He would catch their vibe off the first line and just go in. And then we would just create this magic and he would solo and play all these cool licks on top of it. And I would just, oh, my back to the audience, <laughs> scared playing my little bass lines. It was so funny. And then he paid me at the end of the night, the first gig. I was like, yo, you can make money doing this? He was like, yeah. And don't ever let anybody not pay you to play. So I said, wow. I could do this. So that's the moment, I think, Yeah, and when you, I did, realized. Did you never go back to school? <clears throat> I went to Georgia State. Okay. I was accepted into the jazz program at Georgia State um, <clears throat> at the urging of my family because they started saying, okay, you want to play bass now? I mean, imagine this. Yeah. I never played bass right. as a kid. I come back from one of the best schools in the world with a bass guitar, and they're like, what are you doing? Who are you? Why did you leave school? So the only way that my grandfather, grandma, my parents, my dad, my dad was so just disappointed. Are you the oldest? I'm the oldest. Okay. The first one to really go off to college. So they were like, okay, we can accept this. If you, if you want to stay here, you can do music, but you got to go to school. If you want to do this, so. And I, and I agreed with them because there was so much more I needed to learn. So somehow, 
I got accepted. I, did, I couldn't read. I remember the audition. Oh, he was, this guy was so nice. I cannot remember the director's name. He sat a piece of music in front of me. It was a chart. He was like, okay, read this. And I was like, uh. So he's like, okay, just play. So I just played something. He was like, oh, he was like, you can play. He's like, you just, you just need to learn. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you, you just have, you have to be in my ensemble classes and I'm gonna accept you into the school. So I stayed there for a little while. And everything was so over my head. Yeah. I didn't understand the theory and like all these little, and I was older at this point. All these mm -hmm. little young kids are like blowing me out of the water. They're giggling at me when I'm called on to solo in the class. And I'm just like feeling really bad about myself. And one of the professors asked me once, what do you want to do? I was like, man, I just want to write my songs. I want to get out and play and be on stage and do my rap and my playing. And he's like, go do that. I was like, really? He said, yeah, he said, go do that. I said, okay. And the next time I saw all those kids who were laughing at me, I was on stage with Victor Wooten. That is a really good moment. Crazy. <laughs> so at that point, you'd been able to be an MC and you've been playing bass and listening to your music now, it's astounding that you're able to, you know, put such a concise, uh, you're able to provide the bass foundation and freestyle rap over that. Was that a challenge to get those two skills together? Yes. You know, because the bass is just so rooted and has to be rooted and freestyling requires, you know, being out there. Absolutely. Like um, it's almost like, almost like two different parts of your brain, I imagine. It is, and it's still a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it ever st stops being challenging. Yeah. Which is probably why I enjoy it so much. I like to be challenged and pushed. Um, yeah, it took a while. I mean, the very first song I wrote was the D-I, V-I, and I-T-Y. And that's the song I played at Victor's Base Camp. Okay. Vic has to tell the story because from my perspective, I'm standing there, I'm just playing my song, and I got all this attitude, and I'm in the pocket, and I'm, you know, MCs, you know, all we do is brag on ourselves. Right, you know, right, so right. I'm like bragging on myself about how great I am, and like, and then the song is about my name, which is ridiculous, so. <laughs> Vic is like, he's in the back like, we should take her on the road. <laughs> But he never let on throughout the rest of the camp. Okay, that's great. So I go throughout the whole camp, and I'm thinking, man, I'm learning so much. It was really great. It was an incredible camp. And this is like shortly after dropping out. <clears throat> yeah, after dropping, after leaving uh, Georgia State. Yeah. I ruptured my Achilles tendon, so my the thing with the hip hop group sort of fizzled out a little bit. Um, I couldn't tour. I was down for a year, so all I could do was play bass. All right. And a friend of mine gave me a Victor Wooten CD and said, you, you, you want to play bass? Jermaine, you should listen to this. I listened to that CD. I was like, I ain't going to never be able to play like that. Who is this guy? He's amazing. And then I went through all the liner notes. And I remember the liner notes saying, this record, with the show of hands, this record was recorded with no overdubs. I was like, he a lie. He's lying. There's no way he played all that with no overdubs. So I needed to meet this guy. And so I started low-key stalking Victor Wooten, <laughs> you know, kind of low-key, going to sh doing his shows. And, you know, the Internet was not, like, YouTube was not a big, de big thing back then. So you right. couldn't just pull him up and watch videos. So you yeah. had to, like, people had to pass you a VHS tape. Yeah, so this is like early 2000s? <laughs> yeah, early 2000s. Yeah. Late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. I think it was 90. Eight? When did he put that record out? I feel like that was late 90s. 99, so was, 90. That's around the time like he and Bela Fleck yeah. came to prominence. Yeah. yeah, so I toured with him the December of 2000. Yeah. It was my first tour with him. Wow. So you do the camp, the, the end of the camp, he makes this overture and you're like, yes. I mean, do you automatically know that you're able to do this and that this is your calling? or No. No? Absolutely not. When Victor called me and said, he, so he calls me, hey, Divinity, this is Victor Wooten. He was like, so that thing you do, you did at the camp, is that what you do? I was like, yeah, that's what I do. He said, do you have more songs like that? I was like, yeah. I didn't have any more songs like oh. that. Oh. <laughs> that was my one song. Right. I, had just, I had just figured out I could rap and play together. So he's like, okay, so, you know, I was thinking that 
it'd be cool if you came on tour with me and opened up the show doing that. I like literally lay down on the floor and was like, okay, yeah, I can do that. But inside I'm like, <laughs> my stomach is churning. I got butterflies. I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? I need to write some more songs. <laughs> He's like, well, I think it was like October. He's like, we're going to tour in December. We'll bring you to Nashville and we'll have some rehearsals. And, and I want you to start the show just like that, what you did at the camp. And, uh, and, and we'll have a section in the show where you can do some of your other songs. You can play with the band. Um, and that was that. And then I went on tour with him again. I was thinking, he called me again. Okay. Then I would talk to Anthony and Anthony is like, hey, you know, I think we're getting ready to go on tour again. I'd be like, am I going? <laughs> He'd say, yes, you're going. <laughs> like, oh, cool. And, you know, after that tour, some time would pass because he would go on tour with Bela. Anthony would be like, yeah, I think we're gearing up to go again. I was like, do you think I'm going to go? He'd be like, yeah, fool, you in the band. I was like, I'm in the band? He's like, yeah, what you mean? Of course you're in the band. I didn't know I was in the Victor Wooten band. That's <laughs> bad. So, but, you know, between that lying on your back phone call, just terrified, do you think if that call hadn't come, you wouldn't, you, do you think you would have written more in that style? Yeah, Absolutely. you were headed that way anyway? Absolutely. That's great. So it just gave you kind of the extra push. Yeah. <laughs> now. So, so do how, it now. How many songs did you end up turning out? Or like I think four together? songs. Yeah. Yeah, I had a section in the show where I did four songs. Okay, so it wasn't like, I have to put together 12 songs. No, 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 okay. because he was, you know, it's Victor Wooten's show, right, but he right. allowed, he gave me the space within his show. He would have me, and on the spot, Vic would say, you know, because they, they were all improvising a lot during that show, so they would start a groove, and Vic would be like, Divinity, come out here and bust a freestyle. Yeah. So I would come on stage and freestyle, and... Sometimes he would be, he would, they would play something that was so cool, I would pull out my pad and start writing, and he would see that I was writing, and he'd be like, Divinity, come out here and tell everybody, <laughs> share with everybody what you're writing right now. And I would literally have my notebook in front of me spitting what I'd just written. You oh, know? that's awesome. Oh, we had so much fun. That's great. It seems like, was that, um, you know, you, you leave... Uh, studying music, you, you leave an institution studying music and then you go and get this real world experience. How much of what you learned studying did you apply in the real world there? I don't think I'd studied enough yeah. to really apply. I wasn't thinking about, I was playing with my heart, that's what I'm gonna say. Yeah. I wasn't playing with my head. I hadn't learned to think about music structurally yet. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking about chords and scales and all these different things. I would practice those things and somehow when you're practicing something it finds its way in your playing even without you being conscious of, of it. So I wasn't conscious of it yet. I'm just really becoming conscious of it now when I'm playing. I'm just starting to think more in my playing I've been playing with my heart for a long time. Mm. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to enroll at the school. Yeah. Was so I could start melding together my heart and my head. Right, the school being Berkeley Online. Berkeley, Berkeley Online, yeah. It's amazing that you've done what you've done and you're still <laughs> seeking more education. Oh man. It's great. Oh, I want to be great. Yeah. I do. And I, and I feel like when you do, you, you start reaching for those things that you know will, will make you better and will grow you and challenge you. And I feel like this is going to be the ultimate challenge. You know, I remember Victor Bailey coming to, um, to one of Victor's camps and talking. And one of the things he was saying to the students, um, I was always around students who were so much younger than me. He would say, you know, this is the time for you guys to practice now. You guys don't have to worry about taking phone calls and promoting yourself and, and keeping up with your, your social media, you got, or, or just your business. You, know, you guys don't have to worry about yourselves as a business yet. All you have to do is practice. But once you become 
a certain age or you get to a certain point in your musical journey, you have to start doing business. So I've been doing business and I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah. So it interrupts practice. Right. Even now I'm practicing and I'm, you know, working on something that I'm really loving and I'm, you know, and then my phone is ringing and the emails are coming in and they're talking about shows and these different things and you have this interview and you have to do this. And as soon as I get into it, <laughs> these things are pulling me away and, oh, you know, you have the show, you haven't been promoting the show, you need to start promoting the show. So people go, oh yeah, then I put this down. Yeah. You know? So I need to make time That's for, great. yeah. I mean, I, I'd argue though that all those hours you spent on stage with oh, yeah, Hoot, absolutely. Uh, those are practice. And with Beyonce, all those yeah. hours practicing with Beyonce. Yeah, how did that all come about with, uh, you know, you'd said, so it was before Sasha Fierce, right? It was, yes, it was the Beyonce experience. Okay. And the, the album she released on her birthday. Right, right, right. It, it was such a great band too. And, and oh, it's yes. so awesome that you guys are reuniting for the 10 year anniversary. Not just great as a concept, it was a musically powerful band. It was, it is. It, it is, yeah. It is. So, so tell me about the nucleus of that and how it all came together. And <laughs> well, everybody came to this place from different paths. Um, so you know a little bit about my journey. And um, so I, I, you know, I'm in Atlanta, I'm performing, I'm doing my thing, I'm rapping, I'm playing, I'm writing songs, I'm recording, I'd been out in LA trying to get a record deal, and you know, that whole thing, and um... So wait, just to refresh, it's 2005, 2006? Yeah, 2005, so 2000, from, you know, I'm touring, I'm still touring with Victor. Okay. <clears throat> at this time, so maybe around 2005, I can't, I can't remember. Um, Beyonce put out a press release and she's looking for an all-female band and she's having auditions and uh, and at the time you know I'm still struggling really struggling musician and doing my gigs because I'm touring with Victor but Victor is touring with Bela right. and and doing his own thing so he's juggling all these different things so we didn't tour a lot maybe two or three times a year at the most and it you know he had to spend time with his family so um, so in between touring with him, I'm still doing my own thing and trying to build my brand and learning about marketing and learning how to produce and making beats and, you know. Yeah, where, where are you just teaching yourself all this stuff? Yeah, dude. Wow. I mean, I would have producers because people were trying to take advantage of me. Yeah. They yeah. wanted to sign me and make me give right. away all my publishing. And I had gone to Georgia State, so I had learned about publishing and learned about the music business and really became business minded. So I'm like, I'm not giving you all of that. And then I would go in the studio with different producers and they would sort of try to shape my sound and I didn't like the way it was going and it didn't feel like me. And so I was like, I'm gonna learn how to use Pro Tools and I'm gonna produce myself. So I'm doing this and I'm really serious about it. And you know, I would have days where I didn't shower and I'm just making beats all day and you know, I'm into this song and I'm structuring it. And I'm spending hours on end up all night, you know, doing this. And uh, my sister sent an email and said, hey, you know, Beyonce's looking for an all-female band. I think you should go audition. And I was like, Psh, whatever. That's not true. Like, I thought it was a gimmick. Right. Did not believe it at all. Right. Uh, then people started calling me from around the country who, who I met on tour with Victor. Did you hear this Beyonce is having auditions for an all-female band? You're the first person I thought of. Yeah, what was your awareness of her before that? I mean, you well, of course, I was young. aware right. of her. You, you know, couldn't not be, but um, couldn't not know, be. I from, mean, she was huge, but I yeah, but I'm not. A, I wasn't into pop music. Right, right. I was, you know, real underground hip hop. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Keeping it 100 percent real, and you know, <laughs> so I would see her, and I love. I remember see like I would see videos every now and again. I would pass by a video, check up on it, made me stop. I was like, dang, that beat is dope. And of course she was on all the radio. Yeah. And so all her beats were always dope. The songs were always amazing. And, um, but I just was never, it wasn't on my radar. You know, mm -hmm. I was super hip hop head. So I was like, eh. You know, people started calling. They're like, you should go. And I was like, eh, okay. I'll think about it. But I was working on this song. It was a really good song. I remember it was called, okay, it's a really great song. 
Um, it was called Okay? Yeah, it was called okay. Are You Okay? And it was really personal. I remember the hook was, are you okay? How your mama doing? Are you still dreaming? What are you pursuing? Some days I'm okay and other days I'm not. I really miss you, man. It was like this, I, I needed to say sorry to some people Yeah. in my life. And that song was, was the way I was doing it. So I was very, and I'm all sentimental, right? I told you this. So then uh, I had some other friends, this, this other producer, who had really been hooking me up with sounds and he believed in me as a producer. And he was, uh, he really took me under his wing to teach me things about sound design. And he's like, Divinity, you know Beyonce's auditions for it I'm like, I know. He's like, you should go, you should do it. I'm like, man, but I don't think it's real. I was like, she could call anybody. I think Rhonda Smith is gonna get the gig. I was like, what about Michelle? Yeah. Michelle and Deggio Cello, who else? I had, I, had, I had a list of great yeah. female bass players right. who would probably play this gig with Beyonce. Certainly I was not on that list, seriously. So I was like, she can have anybody in the world. Why would she want me to do it? And they were like, you should go to the audition. So they came over to my house. They really did this, him and, this, and his, his good partner came over to my house one day and I was in producer mode, which means I hadn't showered and I'm like in my pajamas for three days. And they're like, we're not leaving your house until you say you're going to the audition. So I was like, well, sit down, turn on the TV. If you guys want to eat, here's a refrigerator. I remember like I'm all dramatic. You guys can hang out as long as you want. I don't think I'm going to do it. Go back in the room, start working. They hung out too. And I came out and they were like, I'm like, y'all still here. Like, no, seriously, Divinity, you so should go. So is this the day of the audition? No, this isn't okay. the day of the auditions. Probably maybe three, four days before. Okay. And they're like, you should really go. I was like, all right, I'm going to go. I'll do it. I didn't think I was going to get it. I was just going to do it. So she had auditions in different cities. Yeah. So I was going to... in I was, LA? I was in know? Atlanta. I was in Atlanta. Oh, you were back in Atlanta. It's yeah. Like, okay. So um, I show up to the Atlanta audition. I pretty much know most of the most of the girls there. I know them. Yeah. How familiar with her material, like playing her, her material? Did you like sit down and be like, all right, I'm gonna listen to? Yeah, because they they recommended that you get the uh, the Dangerously in Love DVD. Okay. And we were playing the arrangement of um, it was like this James Brown esque song. Okay. So I learned it, um, and I was getting ready to go on tour with Victor at the time. So I go in the audition play the song. When I get there, CNN is there because this okay. is a big deal. Beyonce is having yeah. auditions. And somebody says, oh, you should, you should interview Divinity because they knew me because I've been, you know, all around Atlanta. So I was like, would you do this interview? I was like, sure, why not? You had finally showered, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'd showered. I was looking cute. You know, I had my hair, I was in the makeup, I had a cute shirt on, got all dressed up. And it started becoming exciting, you know, did the interview. And how uh, was the audition itself? She wasn't there. Right? No, she wasn't yeah. there. She had some musical directors and people she trusted yeah. uh, who were there. I played the song, and then they just asked me to play, and then I left. It's <laughs> like, so, okay, I did it. <laughs> and I go home, and I'm getting a little anxious because around midnight, I had, didn't get a call. And, yeah. But I didn't even, it was like, oh, well, didn't get it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. My phone rang after midnight, and... Uh, this deep voice on the phone, like, Divinity, uh, you're gonna uh, go to New York for the second round of the auditions. And I was like, oh, cool, okay. So we're gonna get a plane ticket for you, hotel, blah, blah, blah. After, I had no after money. Midnight. After midnight. That's... I had no money. Yeah. I didn't even know I was gonna pay the rent in the next month, honestly. Yeah. I had negative $200 in the bank, literally. So I'm like, I'm gonna go to New York, how am I gonna eat? What am I gonna do? I called my mom, I'm like, mom, I guess, you know, I'm going to New York for this Beyonce audition. I'm like, I don't know. It still wasn't that big of a deal, yeah, yeah, right? So I get up to New York, I'm nervous, so nervous, so scared, I couldn't eat anyway. Just, oh. And we go through the whole audition process. Uh, I remember the first time I sat down with Nikki and played with her. I turned around and was like, yo, Okay. <laughs> we were playing Deja Vu, I think. Work It Out, that was the song. Yeah, okay. So we play Work It Out, play Deja Vu, kill it. Slowly, you know, the girls who were gonna be in the band started coming in the room together. Right. Because at first they were just putting different 
configurations of girls together. Give me the girl from Atlanta. Give me the keyboard player from Houston. Give me the saxophone player from New York. And so finally they found this combination on the second day of rehearsals. And we were like humping, you know, like it was feeling good. We were having fun. We were encouraging each other, talking to each other like, yeah, you know, like. And what are you playing? Is it just... We're playing Deja Vu, okay, pretty so, much, yeah. over and over yeah. and over again, because it was her single. Yeah. And, of course, it had that crazy bass line. Yeah. Can, um, can you give me the Deja Vu bass line, though? Just... You know? That is, that is. So that is killing, a crazy right? bass line. Oh, it's yeah. so killing. Yeah. And I knew the guy who played on the record. Yeah. John John. John John played that bass line. I had just been hanging out with him in Atlanta. Anyway, so whatever. We play together and then we're tired of playing the song at this point. Like we've given everything we have. And people are watching you too. Yeah, right? you know, Beyonce and Jay-Z showed up. Oh, they're there. Can you imagine? Man, that's pressure. Yes. <laughs> I remember them sitting there. And I'm just like, that's when it became really real for me. And I started like thinking, this could, this could be cool. After all of my, eh, whatever, I was like, wait a minute, this could be really awesome. So I would go in the bathroom, look at myself and say, yo, just dig in, you gotta get this, you can do this. You know, like all these pep talks I would have with myself. Um, but I remember, so, they, so Beyonce and Jay-Z were there, and I think that's when they made the final decision. Now, are they, like, talking with you, or are they, like... Not s- really. ...sitting behind a table, American Idol They're sitting Idol behind style, a table, American kinda. Idol style, you know, smiling, you know, she's just checking us out, you yeah. know, and we're all, like, <laughs> we don't know each other, so we right. aren't, re- you know, we don't know how to act with each other yet. So it was just really, it was just, it's kind of dreamy when I in my mind it's so this dreamy thing you know yeah so they leave and I'm thinking oh man I don't know what's gonna happen they call us back in the room we think we're about to play again so we put our instruments like like, okay we're gonna do this again and Matthew stands there her dad Matthew Knowles stands there and says "Uh, Beyonce has chosen all of you to be in her all-female band and I remember just looking around the room at each one of the girls, slowly, like, just getting a, this moment, just having this moment of looking at everybody and thinking, wow, like, that just happened. And he's like, and you guys are playing the BET Awards in two weeks, so go home, get packed, get ready, and we're going to be doing a lot of work. Crazy. I called my mom, of course. Yeah. Mom. Call Eric on, on three ways. She's called my sister on yeah. three ways. It's like, what happened? I was like, I got the gig. And then I start crying. Yeah. Well, it's a huge oh, moment. Oh my God. I start crying. And she's like, why are you crying? I was like, because I'm so used to everybody saying no. She's like, well, somebody had to say yes. Oh. And we were off. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. And so when did you become the you were the musical director not then no after we'd been I think it was when the tour when we were started rehearsing for tour because we were we're just rehearsing for the promo right we did so much promo yeah oh my god we we would fly to every single tv show that there there was in the world we played it yeah Japan London I mean you know this is our first time going to all of these places Germany New York LA uh we were just flying all the time. Good morning, America, Ellen, Oprah, everything. It was yeah. just like, we're doing this. And so that's also an incredible bonding experience for all you guys, for the band. And is Beyonce right in there with you? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. She was there, yeah. yeah. She was coming to rehearse. I think she was excited. Yeah. I think she, she had been wanting to have a fe- an all-female band for some time. And she really literally chose each and every one of us so she was in rehearsals i mean the beyonce experience when you watch that show you can feel the love and the energy and i mean we put our blood sweat tears you know we fought we 
we, we, we argued, we cut things, we added things, we rehearsed forever, we were tired, we were hungry, we were hungover, we were partying, we were all these things. And you could feel that, you know, in that, in that show to this day, you can feel it. It was really a beautiful, beautiful time. And we bonded as sisters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this goes on for a number of years. Yeah. So, uh, so how many albums in total? I think I think I was on the tour for the Beyonce Experience, Sasha Fierce, and four. Yeah, and, and you played on the albums as well, right? No, we oh, didn't no. play on the albums. I think Nikki played on um, on one of the records. The Horns may have played on some of the tunes. We were in the Irreplaceable video. We played right. on that. Um, they used our recordings on that. Um, but we released live albums. I think from the yeah. shows. Which is now, really why cool. why is that? Uh, is it just she had a I think it's producers. Or, yeah. I think it's the producers a lot of times. Yeah. You know, they pretty much are creating the music and they have their guys coming in. Yeah. And they're presenting tracks that they've done some time ago. You know, right, you, know just, right. you never know. So then, uh, you know, that runs runs its course. Blue Blue Ivy's born, and then there's a little bit of time off, and then she starts something new as she. Well, yeah. Has. When she was having the baby, I kind of thought like. There was a part of me, I think during the four tour, during the Sasha Fierce tour, this person inside of me started to creep up. Your own little Sasha Fierce. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, 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 that girl I left in the bedroom making beats. Yeah. You know, she started to tap me on the shoulder sometimes during the show and be like, what are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? You see me I'm on stage with Beyonce. <laughs> She'd be like, yeah, but I thought we were going to be making songs and doing our thing and I'd be like shut up it's cool <laughs> you know but she really started to uh to pull at me and um and then when Beyonce took a break it just seemed like the right time mm -hmm. for me to to get back into doing what I had been doing and I'd grown so much and I had so much to say and write about and I had to honor that person I had to see if I had it Mm -hmm. I didn't even know if I could do a show anymore. I remember coming off tour and calling my best friend and being like, I don't know if I could get on stage and perform. She was like, what? I was like, I haven't done it in so long. I don't know if I could get up and do my thing. She was like, you're crazy. I was like, no, I don't. I remember the first show I had coming back and I didn't know if I could do it. That's interesting because it's doing part of something you already were doing for like millions of people, and but doing another part that you hadn't been doing for them. I didn't, I just didn't know. I think I became a bass player on Beyonce's tour. Yeah. Before Beyonce, I wasn't a bass player yet. I was an artist who played bass. Right. I didn't really know what it meant to be a bass player in the right. band. I remember in one, after one of the rehearsals thinking, oh, I'm a bass player. This is what this, I'm, this is the role of the bass player. Yeah. This is what the bass player does. <laughs> so, cool. That's what I am. That's what I'm doing. So I left the, you know, the artist sort of, that's when she sort of went to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you weren't, you, I mean, I'm guessing the hours were grueling, so you probably didn't have time to write on your own at all. No, I mean, I would write some, sometimes, but it wasn't at the forefront of right. what I was doing. Right. The, the performer in me wasn't, wasn't out. Right. And now after, after that tour ended and you, you, you know, got back to the bringing, getting back in touch with the performer, you, are you reconnecting with any of these people from the band? Or no, the, because we lived, everybody there, left so and went away. to their different cities because we yeah. didn't, nobody else lived in Atlanta. I was right. the only person in the band from Atlanta. Right, so is this now, this anniversary performance, performances, are, are they the first time that you guys have played together at all since then? I think Nikki said that the last time we all played together was 2010. Wow. Yeah. So tell me about finally being comfortable with this artist within you <laughs> that you have ignored who's tapping you on the shoulder on yeah. stage. Yeah. I had, a, I had a little studio in my basement in Atlanta and I would stay up and write all these songs and it's so funny because that stuff is actually on this album that I just released called I'm Possible. Yeah. But before that I moved to LA. 
I still had this, all these other songs I had recorded that were like really rock and hip hop. I had found this lane where I wanted to meld and mesh rock and hip hop. That, that, that seemed to match my intensity as a performer and as an artist and as an MC. So I figured I needed to go to LA. Moved to LA, hooked up with some cats, recorded an album called um, The Rock's Box Experience. And, and then the band broke up. So I'm just kind of out there. I went back on tour with Beyonce after that, the Rock Spo after releasing the Rock's Box Experience, and then uh, that the four tour after she had Blue. No, I can't remember. And then, um, then I, that's when I finished, like stopped altogether to give myself, you know, the space. So I, I started touring in Europe. I started doing a lot of stuff in Europe. My uh, base company Warwick is German company, mm -hmm. so I spent a lot of time in Germany. Uh, hanging out with them and going to their clinics and and they were you know they were doing ads of me in a lot of German based magazines so people in Germany really had a sense for what I was doing and the rock and the hip hop thing was really happening there I guess so I was touring a lot um, and this last tour I did maybe two years ago or a year ago uh, with these musicians um, Lamar Moore and Julian Litwack we were in the van and I was saying, man, I really need to record a new album. And they were like, we should do it, we should do it. So I started letting them hear all these records that I had been sitting at home late at night playing. And none of them were like rocked out hip hop. Yeah. It was all really pretty stuff and it was soulful and jazzy and just all these snippets of ideas. And it was like this side of me that I had not really shown anybody on stage I, I had not been on stage and they said hey you should uh we should record these songs so we went in the studio and recorded this album i'm possible so you're starting with berkeley online and we, we spoke a little bit before about uh you know before the mics were on about how you know you're going to be on the road and you're going to be taking classes and you can't bring a full-sized keyboard with you but how do you plan on incorporating what you may learn in these courses into your profession? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of master classes yeah. and going to universities throughout Europe, giving master classes, and it really gave me this penchant for teaching that I never felt before. It was super rewarding. My dad years ago had said to me, you should teach. I was like, yeah, right, dad. I'm not, I'm not a teacher. He said, uh, if you want, really want to know something, the way to know it is to teach it. And so I have this wanting and needing to know more about music. Um, and somehow people are inspired by what I'm saying in these classes. So I started thinking, what's next for me? I'm going to continue making music. I can't stop. I love it too much. It means too much to me. I feel like I still have some more things to say and some more things to express. And I feel like I can, I still have some growing to do. When I started playing bass, I put a bass clef on the back of my neck because I said, it's, 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 it's for my life. It's a lifetime of learning. Music is a lifetime of learning. And Divinity Rocks continues that lifetime next semester at Berkeley Online. You can pick up her solo album from last year, I'm Possible, from wherever you buy good music. And you can always find me, Pat Healy, on berkeley.edu slash take note. Thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.